1986, uh, the piece of land that, that Mr. McCombs now owns uh, was, public, was public land, it was forest service land, as was all the other property up at Wolf Creek Pass. There was, in essence, no private land um, in or around the ski area. All of the other ski area buildings and facilities are on National Forest Service land. Uh, the ski area has a long-term lease to operate their uh, operation. Uh, Mr. McCombs proposed a land exchange um, with another partner, Charles Lavelle, uh, to acquire a piece of land right at the base of the ski area. They were originally looking for 420 acres that included highway frontage as well as kind of, uh, big property in the, the current base area of the ski area. Um, the Forest Service at that time did an analysis, what they call an environmental assessment, to look at the pros and the cons of the, pro of the exchange. And they invited the public to comment on it. Um, and they reached a decision in, on February 20th of 1986 to deny the proposed land exchange. Um, for the reason that they said it wasn't in the public's interest to take about 1,200 acres of grazing habitat um, scattered in little parcels around Sawatch County um, and swap it for this 420 acres of federal land right at the base of the ski area. They didn't think the values were right. They thought it was inappropriate to break up a landscape that was entirely public and create a, a chunk of private land right in the middle of it. Uh, it's kind of inconsistent with Forest Service policies. Mineral County, not so much. Uh, the village or the Wolf Creek ski area is in Mineral County, but the private lands that were that Mr. McCombs owned that he wanted to swap us were in Sawatch County. So that was in February. Two weeks later, in March of 1986, the Forest Service issued the exact opposite decision. Uh, during that period of time, um, some conversations transpired. Uh, that there is no documentation of remaining today. So no one really knows uh, for sure what happened in those two weeks. Uh, we've heard from you know, secondhand information from Forest Service staff that were involved that the word came down from on high in DC that the land exchange was to be approved, was to be approved. Um, I don't have any, I can't document that, so I just throw that out there as a possible explanation of what happened in those two weeks. Um, regardless of why it happened, the land exchange did end up being approved in March of 2006, but it was a different land exchange than what had originally been proposed. First off, the, the parcel that Mr. McCombs acquired shrunk. It went from 420 acres down to 300 acres. Um, it moved away from the highway, so he no longer had uh, highway frontage on Highway 160. It moved out of the base area, the current ski area, uh, so they no longer had base area um, real estate, if you will. Uh, at that point in time, you might remember that the Alberta lift hadn't been constructed, so it was kind of, the parcel was kind of off to the side of the ski area at, that, uh, at, the, at the time. Um, and the Forest Service attached an easement to the property that they gave to Mr. McCombs, what they call the scenic easement, that, that, that is still held to this day by the U.S. Forest Service by the public, um, that restricted what types of activities, what type of facilities, an approval process, so on and so forth. They placed a bunch of restrictions on what could happen on Mr. McCombs' private property. So all of us, the, the U.S. public, owns an interest in that piece of property. It's not just a piece of private land. And, and I think that sets this piece of property apart from, I guess, a lot of just private land pieces of property. A lot has happened since then. Um, the parcel sat idle for 15 years or so. Um, then in 1999, Wolf Creek Ski Area sought approval for construction of the Alberta lift, as well as the upgrades to their base area, including the new parking lots that they just finished in the last couple of years, all those terracing, terraced lots. Um, our organization, Colorado Wild, uh, was involved in looking at the ski area part of that um, and what, what the impacts to public land would be from adding the lift and the parking lots, etc. And as we were looking at that, we realized that the ski area's parking lot proposal extended all the way up to this piece of private land. Um, but there was no consideration at that point in time of what building a parking lot up to the boundary of a piece of private land might, uh, might facilitate. Um, so when the Forest Service approved the construction of, of that parking lot, uh, Colorado Wild filed what's called an administrative appeal uh, with the Forest Service, basically asking a higher level official within the Forest Service to take a look at it. And, so, and we said, hey, you guys haven't really considered what the impacts on this piece of private land might be by building essentially a big road right up to the private land boundary. And the Forest Service, the, the 
regional office of, of the Forest Service agreed with us. Um, they backed the parking lot up 250 feet uh, from the private land, the land boundary and said, hey, if we're ever going to build a road across that 250 feet, um, we'll do an environmental impact statement, we'll invite the public to comment, and we'll look at all the issues, pros and cons, you know, and cross that bridge and we'll get there, essentially. Um, that was 1999. Um, you know, sure enough, that what was going on at that point in time was Mr. McCombs was trying to acquire access to his piece of property, year-round access to his piece of property, without going through a public process to consider the impacts of that, uh, of, of gaining that access, without going through a public process about what the what he was actually planning to do on that piece of property, uh, without having to seek all the various approvals that would be necessary uh, to do so. That was his first attempt that ended up being stymied to gain access to this piece of property without going through that public process, just like any other individual would have to go through. Uh, about that same time, you know, in 2000, they did start working through the land use approval process in Mineral County, uh, and they gained pre preliminary approval for uh, what we can call the old village plan, I guess, for lack of a better word, since there's now a new plan, but that's at least in conceptual terms. Um, the old plan was this 2,173 residential units, although, um, you know, it's never been, some of those units are hotel rooms, and um, they counted uh, four hotel rooms as one residential unit, so. Uh, also about 222,000 square feet of commercial space, uh, more than 4,000 parking spaces, etc. A pretty, a very large residential development and commercial development, you know, on the order of something about 10,000 people in terms of uh, its capacity. Um, that Mineral County, you know, shepherded that through the prelim preliminary approval process without a whole lot of conversation. Um, and people were, you know, I think some people in Mineral County, certainly folks here in Archuleta County and in Rio Grande County, um, it was a bit of a wake-up call of what was being proposed in their backyard. Uh, this is a huge project, you know, in a city of bigger than Alamosa uh, in an otherwise undeveloped area. Or at least, you know, that was what it looked like. And it raised a lot of questions, you know, questions about highway safety with all that traffic, questions about wildlife and water quality, and did he actually have water rights to do this sort of thing, and where is the power going to come from, and what about public safety with high elevation, and how do you get people off of there in a nasty storm, and who's going to provide you know, services to this community, police, fire, um, EMS, the sort of traditional services provided by a local government, um, and when in this instance there is an approximate local government, because obviously Mineral County's County Seaton Creek is a long way away from Wolf Creek Pass. Uh, those are all questions that were kind of hanging out there, uh, and people looked to the Forest Service to try to answer those questions. Uh, and for, you know, and we said, well, the Forest Service said they would do an EIS and consider all these impacts before they granted access to this project. Um, sure enough, Mr. McCombs didn't want to go through that process. So in 2001, 2002, uh, he hired a number of lobbyists that encouraged uh, then Congressman Tom DeLay from Texas to introduce riders on unrelated legislation, energy bills, and things of that nature. They would essentially just grant an, an easement across Forest Service land to, to Mr. McCombs to, to build this village. Um, uh, to access it without going through the EIS process that they had agreed to, that, uh, the Forest Service had agreed to do in 1999. Um, fortunately, thanks to uh, the help of a number of members of the Colorado delegation that didn't think it was particularly appropriate for Texas lawmakers to be uh, dictating what happened here in Colorado, um, those initiatives were defeated. And uh, in, in the end of 2003, McCombs eventually tried to start down the road of an environmental impact statement for the Forest Service uh, process that involved public hearings and public comment periods and a lot of, um, eventually a lot of controversy, um, which I'm sure many of you all remember.